Welcome to the Northwest Accounting Educators Conference 2013. Hey, this video is going to be all about what's new in Excel 2013. Now, if you want to download this workbook and follow along, click on the link below the video. Not only that, but this will be a pretty long video. Here's the 13 topics, and there's lots of subtopics within all of these. Since it's going to be a long video, if you go below the video and click on the Show More button, there will be a table of contents with time hyperlinks. And you can click to whichever part of the video you want. Now, Excel 2013. I've been using it for a year. That was mostly beta. It's been out uh, for a bunch of months here in 2013. And there are some amazing things that you're just not going to believe. Now, there's um, four main categories, at least as I see it, of things that they have done. The first thing is they tried to make things easier to do, like charts, pivot tables, and uh, text string manipulation. You're not going to believe recommended pivot tables or recommended charts. It'll take a gigantic data set, and you just click on recommend a chart, and it does all of these calculations and spits out a chart without you having to do the pivot table or the formulas. So they're trying to make things easier. There's going to be slicers and timelines for Excel tables. Quick analysis will do hundreds of things with just a click of the button. And probably the most amazing thing is going to be flash fill. You're not going to believe that for uh, data sets where you need to do text string manipulation, like take first and last name and combine them. The second thing they did is they brought, they tried to bring buttons or for features from the ribbons closer to the objects. So things like quick analysis and charting and even tables. Instead of having to go up to the ribbons and click, 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 the, if, if, for example, for charting, there's going to be a button right next to the chart that you click on to do all the things like add labels and things. The third thing they, um, major category of things they did in Excel 2013 is they added a lot of task panes instead of dialog boxes. So, and we'll look at it, it's mostly in charts, uh, text objects, and pictures. The new charting engine is totally different than in earlier versions. That's probably the, the most different thing. Also in Power View, um, I'll just have a brief example. Uh, that's a whole other set of videos all by itself. But Power View does some amazing things with charts and tables. Like it's, it's all automatic. It's just amazing. And it's all done in a, a simple task. Made. And finally, the last thing is they added a lot of business intelligent features, data, so data model, power pivot, that's if you have uh, Excel Professional Plus um, or the standalone box. There's tons of versions of Excel 2013, and only a few of them uh, have power pivot. I'll actually um, give you a link later for a video from Mr. Excel. He goes over all of the options for how to get Power Pivot and Power View. All of these are unbelievable. They basically can do da um, relational database uh, like modeling and then makes creating pivot tables and reports just quick and easy. They're absolutely amazing. All right, let's get started. Let's look at the first thing we're going to look at animation. Now, watch this. So if I am uh, highlight a set of cells and I come over here, watch. I'm going to make the sound effect, boo. So you can see from now on, when you click, boo, it like animates. Not only that, but if you come up here and change the criteria, these are a bunch of formulas here. Watch how they like drop in like the old Space Invaders game. So this is called animation. Now, the most important thing is how to turn it off. I kind of like it. It doesn't bother me. But here's how you turn it off. You find the Window key and the Pause Break button to get to Advanced Settings. You can get to this through the Control Panel for uh, Advanced Settings. Uh, advanced Settings, System Settings, Advanced Performance Settings, and then right under here, Animate Controls and Elements Inside Windows. I'm going to click OK, click OK. The reason why I'm showing you the keyboard shortcut is because some versions uh, operating system, it's like really hard to get there. But this Window key pause break will always get you there. And then you can turn it off. 
All right, the next topic is just a, one simple thing. Now, I've been using the, the beta and then the Excel 2013 for almost a year, I think, or more than a year. And what's up with this? Like I'm clicking, clicking, clicking. How do I get to the end? There used to be a single triangle and then a line with a triangle. You know, Access has that convention too. And it wasn't until just a couple weeks ago that I finally figured out to jump to the end. If you forget, you just have to hover your cursor and there it is. You have to click and hold Control. So watch this. I'm going to hold Control and click. And that jumps all the way to the end. And then hold, uh, click while holding Control, boop, and it jumps all the way to the front. The old standby is control page down and page up. Control page down is great because it'll move the actual active sheet and expose any new sheets hidden. Control page up goes to the left. Control page down goes to the right. But again, you got to jump to the end sometimes. So knowing the control click is great. All right, now let's go over to File Menu. So that's this right here. There's a bunch of changes here. Um, the most important thing is how do you close it? Hit escape key. So go up to File, Info. There's a bunch of info here. Inspect the workbook and protect the workbook. Uh, we used to have to do, you know, add a password with a different uh, method, but there it is right there. Escape, New. Now, there's something really important about this, and I learned this from Mr. Excel. If you click on this right here, boop blank workbook. This does not open from your start file. This is a complete blank workbook without any of your default settings. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. The uh, default setting, and by the way, options are down here, advanced all the way at the bottom, right here in general. At startup, all open all files in. That location right there, you can have a workbook. And if you control N or add a button to the quat, it'll open your default workbook. So I'm going to go escape, go over to Windows Explorer. Oops, that's off the screen. And there it is in this file path here, book.xl. T for template X. That means it's a template. So every time you open it, it opens as a new workbook and the template remains uh, there. All right, so that's important to know that new, that does not open that default. All right, to see exactly what this means, I'm going to click Escape. And now, Control N. That is my default workbook. I have a default workbook that has certain settings. It has a table. It has some color here. The only way I can get to that is with Control N or if you add a new button to the quad. Again, to emphasize new, this no longer opens up that start file. Boom, if I click on it, it opens up a workbook with no default settings. All right, let's go back up here and look at Open. Very important. There's now two clicks to get to the Open dialog box. So you have to click Computer and then Browse. Now SkyDrive, I have SkyDrive. I like SkyDrive. I use it. You have to sign up, and then you can save out to Microsoft's SkyDrive and save your workbooks there. But to get to the com this computer, you have to click one and two times. Now I'm going to go to File. Open, and there's recent workbooks. We used to have something in 2010 over here, but there's all the recent workbooks. You can um, s go over to Options and Advanced Display and determine how many you want to see. But way down at the bottom is, of the recent files is the Recover Unsaved Workbook. So sometimes in older versions, it was hard to find those. There it is right there. All right, Save. Um, I just click Save. Do we ever use this? No. What do we use? Control S. Do we ever use this? No, we don't. We use the keyboard F12, that Save As. And I'll show you an amazing trick for Save As later. Do we ever use Print? No. Control P. Share. This means if you come down to Account, you can set up accounts. Again, I'm not going to cover this. Uh, SkyDrive. Uh, you could YouTube, Facebook, all those kind of things. So you can share here. You can share your email. 
export. See this PDF? Everyone does it this way. Never again do you have to do that. It's a bunch of extra clicks. Watch this. I'm going to I have already um, done page setup on this. If I control P, just as in 2010 they combine the print dialog box and print preview. It's totally awesome, but you see that right there? I want to save this one sheet as a PDF. So I'm not going to go up to uh, file export. I'm going to hit F 12. And this is true for all of the beautiful file extensions that you can do. Uh, text files, CVS, um, the templates, everything. But there it is. All you have to do is hit F12 and then PDF and Enter. And now watch this. It'll open and there it is. There's the PDF. No more. You don't have to go up to that file uh, share. Close. Alt F4, account, again, we looked at that. But options, that's the old standby. Over here, this is a dialog box. We talked about a lot of um, dialog boxes have been replaced by task panes, but not this. So then you come over here and you can do what you want. All right, next topic. All right, I'm going to click on the Insert tab sheet. This is a worksheet. And now I want to go up to the Insert ribbon tab and recommended pivot tables, recommended charts, and a bunch of other things we're not going to believe. Now look, down here, this is a data set. This data set is not summarized. Normally, before we make a chart, right, we go and we have either formulas based on criteria where we sum add all the, the revenue by region, or we do a pivot table, and then we make a chart. Watch this. I'm going to click in a single cell, go up to Insert, Recommended Chart. And over to the side, look what they did here. It says sum of price by product. That means it went through, that means it went through this product column, got a unique list, and they added all the price. Now it's just trying to be polite, right? It's these two number categories. Price isn't the one we want. It's total revenue. And look at that. There's all the products plotted. Uh, summarize first and then plot it on a column chart. Here's the one price by region. Here's the one I wanted. I wanted revenue by region. It went through the column, summarized it for us, made a chart. Now, that little icon right there means pivot table. So when I click OK, it inserts a new sheet. And there's the pivot table. And there's the chart. Now I'm going to double click this and call it recommended C. I'm going to go back over here. It's just amazing. Let's come over here and go to Insert and then Recommended Pivot Table. This is kind of anticlimactic because that other button did the chart and the pivot table. But look at this. It's giving us a preview over here. Wow, look at that one. It's got the, the region and then the sales rep and then the totals there for revenue. Come down here. There's a collapsed one. So I click OK and it inserts a new sheet. I'm going to double click it and call it Recommended. PT. Now the thing about the recommended PT, uh, if I go over here, or the chart for that matter, you know, most of a lot of advanced users can do it so fast they can build it on their own. But check this out. I mean, after a while getting used to this, you might uh, see that it does some pretty amazing things. And this is fast. I mean, if it's got the pivot table you want, it's faster than the five or six or seven clicks to build your pivot table if you're fast and know what you're doing. So this is an amazing feature. Now, certainly for the beginner user, user this insert recommended pivot table and recommended chart is just amazing. Now, there's some other things in the insert menu. Apps. We used to have add-ins. Now Microsoft want, wants is going in the direction of apps. Now you have to have a SkyDrive account and everything, see all, and then sign in. And there's a bunch of apps. And I'm not going to go there right now, but there's some that are free, some that are paid. You can insert them, and they're super powerful features. Now I've inserted one already, insert apps, and I was getting crime stats. So I'm going to open this. It opens up that task pane. I come over here, and I'm going to click Insert Crime Data. I could check whatever I want there. But this is an example of an app that I downloaded and insert. And there it is under the Insert App. And so there's that crime data. So apps are amazing. Now, I'm actually going to come over here and delete this, because I want to do something. I'm going to highlight all these columns, and then right-click, Delete. 
Control Home. Let's come down here and talk about slicers for tables and slicers for pivot tables. I'll just show you the slicer for the tables are the same for the pivot tables. It just means a fancy filter. So I'm going to come down here. Now the thing about uh, slicers is they've been around in pivot tests, but now they're in tables. And you have to have an Excel table. Now, right now, this is a proper table, meaning there's field names at the top with a different format, records in rows. So I could do lots of things with it. But in order for the uh, slicer to work, we're going to have to convert it to a table. I'm going to go up to Insert Table or Control T. I'm selecting a single cell. This is a proper data set, no blank rows, no blank columns, field names at the top. Control T. Click OK. A lot of amazing things that tables can do. They're getting more and more important as Excel history evolves. There's these, these beautiful drop downs with sorting and filtering. Some of the filters are just amazing. Most ama one of the most amazing things, at least in the past, with these are these are dynamic ranges. Control down arrow gets me to the bottom. As I add new records, any pivot table or chart or formulas or power pivots or data models that are pointing to it, will the ranges will expand. But for us, a slicer. Now we could come up here and do a filter, right? There's our little uh, drop downs. But notice it takes an extra click. You have to know what you're doing, and it's not as visually appealing as it could be, especially when building dashboards and things like that. So now we simply have our table. We go up to Insert. Over here, there's filters, there's slicers, and timelines. You could also come over on Design for the Table Tool and the Table Tool, and there it is. Insert. Slicer, I'm going to go back to Insert. There it is. I'm going to click the Slicer. And it's asking you of all the fields, which ones do you want? Hey, let's do Region. And just to show you, let's do a Sales Rep, because they are connected. There's certain Sales Rep for certain regions. It instantly puts two slicers in. I'm going to actually Control and roll my wheel just to uh, zoom in. I can point to the edge. I can go up to the options here. I'm going to say, give me four columns. Four columns. Expand this over here. Up. I'm going to drag this over here and watch this. I'm going to go back up to options. I think I'll make this one a different color. Just having some fun here. Then I'm going to come over, drag this one over here. This has got a lot of. A lot of people in different regions. So I'm going to come up to here. I'm going to make it four. OK, so far so good. But watch this. I'm going to click East. And no way. It filters over here. And these two slicers are connected. Now we'll make those invisible in just a second. But just think about this. Instead of having to click up here, these slicers are slicing our table up. I could click Clear That. And now I could come over here and see just blank and instantly blank. Now, an important thing is if you want to highlight like the first whole row, and you click on the first one. And before clicking on the last one, you hold Shift. Notice this is adjusting up here. I just love that. But Shift, click the first one. Before clicking the last one, click Shift. If you want ones that are not next to each other, then you have to use the Control key. All right, so then only those people are showing the filter. I mean, that that is profound. Now, let's do a little trickery here. I'm going to right click this slicer and go to Slicer Settings at the bottom. And then over here, I'm going to say Hide Items with No Data. Click OK. Right click, Slicer Settings, Hide Items with No Data. And now, when I click on Midwest, it shows me only those. So you could size it, and you could size it however you want, but south, it shows me just those ones. Now I'm going to clear this filter because I want to see everyone east, midwest, southwest. That's absolutely amazing. So it has some benefits because it's easy to click and filter, but it also, when you connect them like this, it's a great way of saying, hey, who are all those sales rep in the south over here? And then you go analyze their records. Now, I want to show you timeline, but I want to do a pivot table. And I got to show you something new in 2013 about pivot tables. Now, single cell selected, and then we go up to Insert, Pivot Table. Now, that's the same. 
since 2007. But the keyboard shortcut, in particular the Alt keyboard shortcut in 2007 and 10 is Alt, N, V, and T. So here's what I've been doing for the whole year I've been using 2013, because I can never remember. Alt, N, V, T. And what happens is you the T isn't needed anymore. The new keyboard shortcut is Alt, N, V, Enter to put a new pivot table on a new sheet. And so I keep hitting T, and it replaces the table range. So Alt, N, V, and then Enter. See, if I hit T, it's highlighting that table, and that uh, is not what I want. So I hit Enter, and there's a new pivot table on a new sheet. All right, my pivot table's floating here. I'm going to call this um, pivot table timeline. All right, so I'm going to take the date and drag it to row. And I'm going to come over here and right click group, new icon there. I'm going to say months and years, because this has months and years. Now I'm simply going to drag revenue to the values. All right, so there we have it, a simple pivot table. Now let's insert a timeline. And again, this is a pivot table, so you can go to Insert and Timeline. Let's do it this way. And there it is, Date, and I'm going to click OK. So watch this. This is amazing. All this is is a filter, just like that slicer. So I'm going to come up here. I can say Years. There it is. I can just click there, and it's just got uh, 2013, there aren't any in 2015, so I say 2013. I can come up to quarters. You've got to be kidding me. I can slide it. I can slide it. I can see from quarter three to quarter two, and there I have it. You can come up here to months, and then there's months, and you can slide. And you can do some fancy formatting on this too. So up here, you can change the color, make it yellow or something like Oh, that's terrible. So then you can come over to days. Oh, you're kidding me. Look at that. And it's got all the months and the days. So you can really be specific. So I click right there and drag. All I want to see is for Oct from October 7th to 12th. Go back up to years. That is pretty amazing. So. We saw two types of uh, visually more appealing filters, a timeline. We saw the timeline and pivot table. And we saw the uh, filter over here, slicer filtering the table. Now we got to go and talk about quick analysis. Now remember two things that Microsoft wanted to do with 2013. If we have a table, they wanted to bring options from the ribbons closer to the table. And they want to make things like pivot tables and charting easier, in essence, a one click. So watch this. I'm not going to highlight the whole table, because I want to show you what happens. If I highlight this table, that little thing's called Quick Analysis icon. I can click on it, and there's five tabs formatting options, charting options, total for formulas, tables that's not only convert to a, a table or a pivot table, and then spark lines. So let's talk about this formatting. Now, notice right now, uh, this is not the probably the best data set because there's lots of types of data, but notice that there's some numbers over here. So it's got this color scale icon set and then some conditional formatting for numbers. But if I were to highlight a data set that had mostly text, the options change. So there's some options for the dates, last month, last week, yesterday, and some options for text, contains, equals, and even clear formatting. All right, so formatting, perhaps I wanted to do data bars. I had some numbers. I simply click on this and data bars. That's conditional formatting. It highlights the longest bar with the longest number. The shortest bar will be with the smallest number. I'm going to Control Z. I'm going to highlight the entire data set. So I'm going to click in a single cell and I'm going to use Control Asterisk on the number pad. If you don't have asterisk on the number pad, use Control Shift 8. And watch this. I love this. So the idea is right next to the data set, Oh, and you can't see it. It's off the screen, so I have to pull this up. But this is worth it. Brrrr. Control asterisk, and here it is. There are our charts, the same ones we saw earlier for the same data set. So we don't even have to go up to Insert. They're right here if we highlight the data set. That is just amazing. Or under Tables, we have our pivot tables, Summarize Data. So the idea is 
quick and easy with a single click, create the products as we see up there, summarized revenue, and it's right next to the table. Now, let's go over here and look at a great option for formula. So I immediately see this. I can control Q. I have charting totals. Totals gives us formulas. Now, look at this. These are for sums at the bottom. But right over here, there's a More button and there's More. These mean that you get a whole column of formulas. So if you were summarizing data to the side, sum, average count, percentage total, that's amazing. Look at that. That one right there shows me the percentage total of all of the hours added together. And here is a running total. Absolutely amazing. And it puts a pretty cool formula in there with an expandable range. So that's with formulas. Let me scoot this down here. Another great one is I'm going to use Control Q. And if you get the hang of this, the arrow keys will move you through the tabs. So I stop on totals. Tab key will move you in. And then you can arrow and say I want an average. I hit Enter. So again, Control Q, the arrows move through. Tab moves into, arrows move through. Shift tab will move back up. Shift tab will move back up, and then I can arrow through whatever I want. So those are the keyboards for that. So now let's look at the spark lines. I'm hiding, highlighting this. I'm going to Control Q, arrow, arrow, arrow. Oh, it's off. So Control Asterisk, Control Q, arrow, arrow, arrow. And spark lines, I'm going to hit Tab and arrow. No, I want lines, so I'm going to back arrow and Enter. A spark line is a little chart in a cell that's looking at this data and showing you a visual single cell chart for that data right there. So uh, quick analysis is absolutely amazing. Now I want to go look at task panes. Now I'm going to come over here and click on task pane notes. Now task panes, they will be invoked by selecting three different objects, charts, pictures, and text objects. Not only that, but we have a new set of icons we'll see in the task pane. Fill in line, effects, size, and properties. Format, series, chart element. This is an example of an icon that will only show up when you have a chart series selected. Text and fill, text effects. These are when you have text objects, text boxes, and pictures. That icon will show up only when you have a picture selected. Now let's go over to chart, picture, text sheet. And I want to compare and contrast how we would format charts, pictures, and text objects in 2013 and 2010. Let's start in 2010. If I select a picture, sure, there's a ribbon up here. There's a single ribbon. But that didn't have all of the options. So I would use the keyboard Control-1 to open up the Format Picture dialog box. And look at that. On the left, a complete list of all the things we could do. Now let's go over to 2013. 2013, I select a picture, Control-1. Wow, look at this. There's an icon for fill and line. If I wanted to get to fill, I would open this up. There's effects. There's size and properties. And there's picture. No way. You cannot get a full list. You have to click through the four different icons to actually get the complete list. So there's a little bit of a learning curve over in 2013 of how to use this task pane. Notice, if I click anywhere, cells, another object, a different object, this task pane doesn't go away. To get it to go away, you actually have to close uh, the X there. Now I'm going to select, uh, click on a chart. Control-1. Now notice it says Format Chart Area. For charts, you're going to have a different title at the top if you select a different element. Now this is the same back in the dialog box. It says Format Data Series. The dialog box would say Format Data Series. Format Plot Area. Format Legend. Again, you're going to have to click through if you want to put it on the top. right? You just click that, and then it sends it to the top. Now I'd like to talk about charts. I'm actually going to scroll over, keeping this sheet selected right here, chart picture. We're going to jump over here in a second. But let's just take a look here and compare 2013. There's only two ribbons, design. And they've actually moved things around. Select data used to be over here, right? 
and format. So let's go look. There's two of them. Let's go look at 2010. If I select the chart, there were three. Layout had a lot of things in it, including labels. Again, one of the ideas is this is 2010. You had to come up to the ribbons. In 2013, well, there's that tab isn't there. So what they did is they brought it right down here. If I select this plus, it'll give me chart elements. And there's a bunch of options, including data labels, right? So I can select, I can even go to more, click on this arrow. And if I have data labels, if I check it, I can put them inside the base, outside data callout. Well, that's pretty cool. Not good for this chart, but maybe for some others. If I click More Options, and it jumps me over to the Task Pane. And then you can do what you want. There's four different icons here. Let's go over and actually look at a little bit more about charting. Now, Task Pane Notes. For these black sheets, if I Control P, it has, you can just print it out. By the way, if you highlight all the sheets using your Control key, you can print them all out at once, Control P, and it will give you a nice little page number, one of whatever down there at the bottom. I'm going to be sure to unselect this, right click Ungroup, or click on a sheet that is not part of the selected sheets to deselect it. Chart Notes. Very important, if I Control P, I know for me it was hard to switch from earlier versions to 2013. So I have three examples here of what it looked like in 2010 and what it looks like in 2013. So you can print that in and, and take a look. All right, so chart elements. I'm going to select here. If I go, again, the idea is they took the stuff from the ribbons and brought them closer to the object. So plus, we saw that there, a data table. Well, I wouldn't want that. I'm probably already going to use this table down here. And as we saw just a moment ago, there's more. That'll give you some options here, or it'll jump you over to the task pane. Formatting. Now, this is kind of cool. There's some automatic styles in here. So you can come down once you create a chart. And right away, you just click on the Format button, and boom, it's got some formatting. You know, I tend to not use the built-in formatting. I think I can eye it myself and do it, but certainly, uh, it is a great feature for uh, automatically changing things. Now, one thing that's nice is here's the Color tab. So up here, we only had Chart Elements. But down in Format, you have Style and then Color. So you can just instantly click and change the colors. So there you go. The Filter, this is new. You can actually uncheck. Actually, it's not new. You used to be able to do this. Also, it just was not right next to the chart. You can uncheck. right? And so right away, if I uh, click Apply, there is the filtered chart. I'm going to click these, show them all, and click Apply. Categories, you can even uncheck and not show chin. So if I click Apply, boom. Hey, that's kind of cool. Again, it's right next. I kind of like this for filtering. Names allows you to not show row 20, which was um, th these names right here in the legend. So if I clicked selected none and apply, I would not see the name. So that would be kind of silly. I'm not quite sure what I'd use that for. I definitely love it when I have the ability to link a chart element like the legend to the cell. So I'm going to click row 20 and apply. All right, so charts, a, a learning curve. Uh, but once you get it, these, these things are kind of nice. Um, this takes a little bit of learning. Chart notes, uh, chart icon notes. Uh, there's even some notes over here. Again, if you Control P, it'll print out nicely. Now, probably the most amazing new feature is called Flash Fill. I'm going to click on the sheet Flash Fill. Now, what it will do is you have either some text or numbers or dates or times. And let's say you want to extract the first name or last name or just the initials. Flash Fill will automate the process for you. Now, Microsoft calls it programming by example. So that means you type an example, first one, Enter. And then as soon as you start typing the next example, oh, that drop down example pops up. It's trying to say, hey, is this what you want? I'm going to hit Enter, and just like that. If I come over here to last, 
type the last name, and then P, just like that, enter. Flash fill. You gave it two examples. It flashed, filled, and completed it for you. Now, notice we're, not, we're doing this without formulas. So this is not linked to the source data. Formulas have their place in that when, if you really want to always extract first and last and this data will change, well, then you got to use formulas. But for most of the time, this type of task, you do not need a formula. Watch this. I'm going to type N space L, Enter, and then M. I got my initials, Enter. I can reverse it. I could type L-E-B-E-R space and then Neil. Enter. As soon as I start to type P-R, it has reversed it. Oh, look, I still have this open. I can insert, so I can type L-I-E-B-E-R comma space. So now I'm inserting a character and reversing the text. So now I'm going to type P, and just like that, you've got to be kidding. We gave it two examples, and it guessed program by example, and boom. We can change the case. If I like Neil, and then L-I-E-B-E-R, Enter. As soon as I type a little m, no way. Let's look at a bunch of other examples. It's just endless what you can do. Combine, so I can type N-E-L, and then the last name. Now, if it is a, if you've given it one example, and this one example will fit all of the data, you can use, and shoot, I don't even know where it is. I think it's under data. Flash fill. Now, I'm going to not use the ribbon method. I'm going to control E. Absolutely amazing. Now, we could do this same example and then combine and insert a character. So dot L-I-B-E-R. Again, again, if it's an example that will work for the entire column, control E, just like that. Now, here's an example where we have a disconnected data set. And so if I want first name, I can type the first name there, but I'm going to have to highlight the whole column and then Control E. So then it gets just the first. Our next example, we got to see some examples where given it one just example will not work. So here, I want first and last initials. So if I type Neil space L, Control E, it tries to obey, but it doesn't have enough information. It doesn't have enough examples to properly flash fill. I'm going to control Z. All right, so we give it that example and then come down here and type Kelly. So what we're doing different here is we're saying, hey, when you see two words, first word and first letter of second word, but if you see word nothing, just extract the first word. So now when I control enter and control E, it knows what to do with those two examples. So down here it properly got Althea. Here's another example. We're going to have to probably give it three examples, but we want first and middle, including that J period. If I type GG Phyllis, what I'm telling Flash Phil is if you three, see three words, extract the first two. Enter. Now I'm going to type Tom, and notice there are only two words. So if I accept this and hit Enter, I've instructed Flash Phil three words, give me two. Two words, give me one. But this Thomas J, I want that period. So I need to give it a third instruction. I'm going to Control Z, Z. The first instruction is, hey, if you see three, give me two. The second instruction is, if you see two, give me one. But the third instruction will be, Thomas, if you see three and the second one has a period, then please get the period also. Now if I Control E, it fills perfectly. Isn't that cool? Now, I love this. This is uh, the formula for doing this is, you know, it's doable, but it's not the easiest formula because we have some situations that are different in each case. All right, let's go down here. You, we can do dates. So if I want the year 2012, and now I'm going to use Control E. What's cool about the programming behind the scenes is these are serial numbers. If I control shift tilde, which is apply general format, home, general. If you know anything about dates, those are serial numbers. So it works. I'm going to control Z. 
flash fail works on serial numbers or text strings, right? The day, I simply type 24 control E. And just like that, I get the days of the month. I'm going to type a 7 control enter and then control E. And just like that, flash fail the months. Absolutely amazing. Now, in this situation, we're given dates um, with the year, the month, and then the day. If we come over here and type 07 slash 14 slash 2001, I'd think that this would work. Control E. Whoa, wait a second. Look at that. There's no leading 0. So the fact that there's a leading 0 is messing up. Now I'm going to leave that here and watch this. We're going to pre-format. And I learned this trick from Mr. Excel. So not only are we going to have to give flash fill a good example, but we're going to have to pre-format it. Control-1. I'm going to come down to Custom. I need a lead 0. M means month, D means day, and Y means year for custom date number formatting. So I'm just going to type MM. If I type a single M, it just puts the 7. But that extra M adds a leading 0, slash DD, slash year, 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 year. Now technically for the year, it's different than these other ones. You only need 3 to show the whole year. Click OK. And now watch this. Because I've pre-formatted it, 07 slash 14 slash 2001. Control Enter, Control E, boom. Flash fill is working fine. It's got the 1115. It's even got the 41 2008. Now, what about inserting? We get telephone numbers like this, and I need to have a bunch of extra digits. If I put the parentheses and the dashes in there, it just flat out inserts them. Control Enter, Control E. Look at that. I love it. Now, what about? Uh, dollars and cents. There's a currency format on this. Well, what if I want the pennies? 0.65, Control Enter, Control E. Just like that, it gets just the pennies, 56 and 20s. What about the integer 97? Hey, look, it's going to see underneath there, see the 97, even though there's currency number format. Control E, just like that. We can also, right here, if I Control-1, you can see, oh, it's got general. But here, I'm going to extract it and apply a format. Dollar sign, 97. Control-Enter, Control-E. I'm going to Control-1 and look. And sure enough, look at that zero currency. That is amazing. So we flashed fill the, num the, the actual part of the number and some number formatting. Now here's a silly example here. But check this out. That, that's a serial number, and that's a number with currency format. And we can actually mash them together, combine them. I just typed out the date with an equal sign. So we take these two things and insert an equal sign. And it will Control Enter, Control E, fill them as text items. All right, let's scroll down here. Time. What if we wanted from a serial number time? If I Control Shift tilde, which is general number formatting, any time is a serial number between 0 and 1, representing the proportion of 1 24-hour day, Control Z. But I want the hour. Let's just try this. 1, Control Enter, Control E. Well, that's not going to work. What we did is we gave an example. Before the colon, take the second uh, number there, Control Z, Z. Watch this. I th I would think 1, 11, we give it two examples, Control E. We get this error message. It, even if I highlight this, Control E, error message. Even if I go like this, Control E, not going to work. But watch this. We're just going to pick the example, the one example we give it. One of the ones with two digits before the colon, 12, Control Enter, Control E, that will extract from a serial number and put into the cell an actual integer. That's 11. Minute. Let's just try 12, Control Enter, Control E. Now, 48, that's not going to work. So this is an example where we need to give it two examples, Control Z, Z. I'm going to type 12, Enter 18, Enter Control E. And that will work. That will extract the minutes. We gave it two examples of extracting the two numbers between the two colons. Now here it worked. It gave me 0, 0, and there it gave me a 0. All right, two more examples. This is kind of a silly example. Um, we've already seen an example of this. But if we had student ID and we wanted to insert some characters, 
if I typed it right, Control Enter, Control E, and just like that, we have gone from a number to a text item, right, with some dashes, inserted some dashes. Now, one uh, last example here. If we have in a column two choices, two colors, right? Notice the first one's red, red, and down here is sand, sand. We could get into trouble if we want the last. So red, control, E. Then it's obvious, well, in this case, it took the first one, blue, gray, violet, control, Z, Z. So in this case, let's give it two examples or pick a different example, blue, control, enter, control, E. And so if we pick the right example, it knows to take the red, I mean, it knows to take the first ones all the way down. All right, flash fill, totally amazing. Now let's go look at new functions in 2013. I'm going to click New Functions Notes. Now there's 50 of them, and you can Control P and read that sheet there. We're going to look at four of them. RRI is a new finance function that use, calculates the average compounding rate for an investment. Is formula tells you whether a cell contains a formula or not. If NA is a great new function. If there's an NA, then it puts something in the cell. And formula text. We've been waiting for this one for a long time. This shows you in a separate cell what the formula is in a different cell. Now let's go over to the sheet New Functions. We'll start with if NA. Now VLOOKUP, here's our table. We have sales rep and commission rates. And we need to simply look up and return to this cell the commission rate. So I'm going to look up Bob, comma, within this table right here. I'm going to hit F4 to lock it, comma. The item we want to return is in the second column. So I type a 2. That table first column is not sorted, so we have to put false for exact match or 0. Control Enter. Double click and send it down. Now check this out. In our business, we have some people that are under contract that have a specific contractual uh, commission rate. But all of the other salespeople get a default of z uh, 0 0.01. So this is the perfect situation where we can do if NA. Now if NA. If NA. Now, before 2007, you'd actually have to use the if function, is NA, and list VLOOKUPs twice. In 2007, 2010, and in 2013, there's if error. But that function checks for all errors. In some situations, you only want to check for NA. Like, for example, maybe you wanted to see when there was a divide by 0 error. So if NA will only put whatever the value if NA, only if it's an NA error. If it's a divide by 0, then boom, it will not uh, put this in. It will give you the error. So I'm going to type 0 0.01, close parentheses, Control Enter, and double click and send it down. So all of the people who are not in our table get the default rate of 0 0.01. I don't have an example here of here. 1 divided by 0 would be good, but sometimes you are um, dividing by some number, and the cell happens to be 0. And so you want to see that divide by 0 error. All right, now let's come over here and look at our next function. We're going to look at the RRI. Now, here we go. We have begin invested. We put 1,000 bucks in. Uh, a number of years later, we have 5,500 in the account. We invested in 91 and want to figure out what the compounded rate is in the year 2013. First, we need to know the number of periods. So I'm simply going to take the later year minus the earlier year. So we left it in for 22 years. Now, the four, what we're doing is we're calculating an average compounding rate. It's not the actual return each year, but over those periods, it tells us the average rate. This is done calculating a geometric mean. And the longhand, and is you take the n divided by the begin in parentheses and then raise it to 1 divided by the number of periods. Now, I need to force that division to happen before that exponent. So I have to go like that. And then I subtract 1. OK, so if you're a finance person, you know about this geometric mean. But now you don't have to know the formula, RRI. It simply says, hey, what are the number of periods? 22. Now. PV and FV are usually used in financial function like future value, present value, PMT rate. And they usually 
require the right cash flow. Present value is usually negative. Uh, in this investing case, and future value would be positive. But here, you just put the two numbers in. So the present value would be this, and the future value with that. I'd actually prefer if they'd named that something different than PV and FE, because then that doesn't follow the convention of the other financial functions. That is awesome. I know in my finance and statistics classes, uh, students will appreciate that, because that, that one's usually a rough one for them on the test. Now, there's a couple other great functions. Oftentimes, I make templates for students like this. And I want to show on the answer sheet not only the green cells with the calculated result, but over to the side, I want to show the formula. So in the old days, I would scoop this out, Control-C, come over here, Space, and Control-V. And I do that for a whole column. You know, Sometimes the finance and statistics sheets had 30 calculations or something. No more. But now we just go equals formula text. You've got to be kidding me. And it will look in a different cell and tell you what the text is. Now, I'm going to show you a trick here. I usually don't enter it just like this. I usually enter uh, one space before. So I type a double quote space, double quote, and then the join symbol ampersand. The reason why is that'll put a space now. If you ever convert these to values, uh, then if you have no space and the cell gets put into edit mode, it will actually calculate. So I like to leave it like that. I'm going to Control C, Control V. That's awesome. But here's one step further. And this is why I'm so happy about not only formula tech, but is formula. I have these templates with lots of inputs like this and then cells with formulas. And I don't want to have to pick out all the cells when there's uh, 50 rows and 30 formulas. So watch this. You can simply come over here and do if and then is formula and ask the question, are you a formula? If you are, which means true, the is functions are always true, false, logical uh, functions, then I want formula text. Otherwise, if it's false, meaning it's not a formula, please show nothing. Double quote, double quote. That's the syntax for show nothing. It's actually a null texting. Control Enter and copy it down. I absolutely love that one. So those are some amazing new functions we saw. If and A, we saw this amazing RRI. And there's an is formula and formula text. Now, we want to talk about Excel 2013 business intelligence features, or BI features. I'm actually going to scroll over. We have a sheet called Data Model, Power, Pivot, and then there's one called Power View. Those are the three business intelligence features we're going to look at. And we're going to start with the data model. Now, here's the situation. The data model will allow us to take two tables, show them in the pivot table field list, and select fields from both tables. So we're going to be able to build pivot tables from multiple tables. Now, what do we do normally? If we didn't have the data model or power pivot, here is a data table. We have sales rep column and revenue. Over here, we have a different table with a unique list of sales rep and the regions that they sell in. Now, if we didn't have data model, we simply add a VLOOKUP, look up the sales rep, get the region, add an extra column. Then, boom, we could summarize revenue by region. But that adds an extra column, extra formulas, and overhead. So we can use the data model, connect these two tables, and build a pivot table from two different tables. Now, it's important to note that the data model, it is in 2013. It's not in earlier versions. If you have Power Pivot, you're never going to use the example I'm going to give here. This example is how to use the data model to connect two tables for people who don't have Power Pivot. And here's the crazy thing. The data model engine is really part of Power Pivot. Right? But they put it, the Microsoft put it in, and there's a cool way we can use it even if we don't have Power Pivot. All right, you ready? Well, the first thing is this is an Excel table. This has a name. If I go up here, Design, I've given it Transaction DM for Data Model. We actually later are going to have some similar tables, so I'm going to call this one DM. we got to name it, get, I mean, convert it to a table, name it, and it will show up in our field list. So I'm going to come over here, use the keyboard Control-T, 
and to create a table and enter. Now I could go to Design and click right there, but if you do this a lot, it's worth learning the Alt keyboard, Alt J T A, and immediately I can see that it's highlighted. I'm going to type Sales Rep Region D M, and so you can see it there. Enter. Now we have our two tables. We simply have to take one of the tables, Alt N V, no no T. And right there, I check that, or Alt-M, Enter. And there we go. It's going to insert a new sheet. It'll take a little while here. Click over here, and now we see a field list that looks different than the field list we saw earlier. There's an active and an all. Now let's look through this. There's a bunch of tables. And oh, look, the dark one is the one that's been added to the data model. If you hover over one of these other ones, there's a bunch of tables in this workbook. Uh, so it gives you the data source. It's a table. There's the name and then the range. This screen tip is different because it's in the data model. So it says data source table, the, the name of the table, the range, and then model table name, transaction DM. Now, if you didn't give it uh, a Excel table name and convert the range to a table, it would just say range here, which would be terrible. terrible. Now look, our sales rep region DM is here. It does, it's not black yet, but watch this. Let's try to build a, a pivot table from both. Now I'm going to click on the active sheet, and I can see there's only one table. So over in all, I'm going to right click Show in Active tab. And now we'll see two tables over here. Now let's see what happens. I'm going to drag the region to the rows, and I'm going to get revenue and drag it to the values. Now, immediately it's going to give us the wrong answer. That's the total for everything. And here's the backwards way, since we don't have Power Pivot, that we're going to have to create this relationship. There's a yellow dialog box that says relationship between tables may be needed. Well, that's for sure, because it's not. it doesn't understand. It actually is just dropping the total for everything for each reason. So I'm going to click Create. And here is our relationship window. Now. Foreign and primary. The primary means this is the primary key. We mentioned earlier there was a unique identifier for sales rep. Th that means that that's our table. We want sales rep region DM. And the primary key is the unique identifier sales rep. And then we use sales rep from the second table. That will be our foreign key. So I'm going to come over here and trans transactions DM. And there it pops up, I'm going to click OK. And now we see they're both uh, dark, which means they're both in our model. And look what happens, immediately updates. That's pretty amazing. And you're not just limited to one table like this. You can start adding a bunch of extra tables. Now I'm going to come down here and immediately call this DM for Data Model Pivot Table. All right, so right now I actually stopped the video and I deleted that sheet because I want to show you a second method for creating a relationship between these two tables. Now I've deleted that sheet and the relationship. So I have a single cell. I'm going to Alt N V, Alt M to get my data model and Enter. Once the pivot table tools come up, I'm going to go to Analyze and there's relationship. Now we can go over and look on all there is no relationship. All right, So now we can build it this way before we see that yellow button. I'm going to click New. Our foreign key is going to be our transaction DM. We can select Sales Rep. The primary key comes from the Sales Rep region DM. And that would be our Sales Rep. So now we're creating our relationship. Click OK. And there we have created a relationship close. And so now it is part of the data model. Over on the active sheet, we only have one. So we have to come over to All, right click, Show Act Inactive tab. And boom, now we can build our table. We have regions and revenue. And you can you know, pivot this however you want. But we've connected the two tables so we can read data. It's taking the category or the criteria for making this calculation from the sales region sales rep region DM table, and it's taking the revenue numbers from the transaction DM table. I'm going to come down here, double click, data model, pivot table, enter. 
Now, a couple more things about data model. I'm going to go look up at relationships, and I'm going to click Edit. For those of you that have been using Excel your whole life and never have done relational databasing, primary key and foreign key can sometimes be confusing, but no problem. If you've done VLOOKUP, you know what primary and foreign means. Hey, in the first column of the VLOOKUP table, there's exactly one instance of each item. If there's duplicates, it causes trouble. It's same with primary key. Just like the first column of VLOOKUP, there's only one instance of each item. So sales rep name is only listed once. That way, when we're looking up lots of the sales rep names from the transaction table, it goes over, it finds exactly one sales rep, gets the region, and brings it back. That's primary key. Foreign key is like where the VLOOKUP would be sitting. Primary key is like the actual lookup table. I'm going to click OK, click Close. We've got to talk about a couple other points about data model. I'm going to click on the data model note sheet. Hey, guess what? Oh, this is a bummer. If you use the data model, there's no grouping in a pivot table. If you drill down, only a thousand records come out. And this is true over in Power Pivot. Now, Power Pivot is so amazing because of the f uh, all the functions and the formulas you can build that you overcome. Uh, well, I don't know how you overcome this one, but this one you overcome by adding extra columns and adding like the month function or the year function. Ah, but there's no grouping. Another note. We've always seen of the 11 functions in a pivot table, product. That's no longer there. If you use data model, distinct count replaces product. Now, that's amazing because the formulas to do a unique count are quite complicated, and now it's built right in. When we learn Power Pivot and uh, all the DAX functions, there's a great distinct count function. Now, I want to show you quickly two examples of these. I'm going to go over to my, um, actually, the data set. Here's the table. I'm going to Alt N V and Alt. M for data model and click Enter. Watch this. If I drag the date down to the row, right click, oh, it's, there's no grouping. And you can't group other numbers also or even items. That's no problem. We'll uh, add extra columns for that. One final note. Let's, I'm going to right click, delete this. Let's come back over here. And I want to show you about the 1,000 records. I'm going to quickly change this function count, summarize values, to count. We can clearly see there's 1,100. But if I double click this, this is called drilling down, it should extract all 1,703. And what does it do? Control down arrow. It doesn't extract all of them. Now I'm going to right click Delete. Hopefully, they'll fix that in future versions. I'm going to right click, change this to summarize values and sum. Now, we've got to talk about everything we talked about data model, except for that, uh, the silly way that we created a relationship with that yellow button here. Uh, all the things we talked about are going to be the same over in Power Pivot. So let's go talk about Power Pivot. Now, I actually want to click on the Power Pivot note sheet. Why Power Pivot? You know what? I see that this is been askew for a long time. I don't know how long that's been askew there. So why do you want to use Power Pivot instead of, say, formulas or regular pivot tables? Uh, well, of course, you get all the advantages of pivot tables. They're fast, easy to create and change report quickly. I mean, that's the pivot, right? You can pivot it. Uh, you can do your relational database inside Excel with a pivot table user interface. We already saw that with the data model. Ah, you can bring big data into Excel. Billions of rows, at least a billion rows. I mean, that's a lot of data. The most important thing is that calculated fields or DAX measures are going to be formulas inside our Power Pivot pivot table. And they're much more powerful than normal functions because you can use them in pivot reports. Now. The thing about, and I'm going to show you an example in just a second, the thing about uh, regular form is, is you cannot pivot a formula. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, so really, lots of data, these, um, this amazing new formula, uh, DAX measures, calculated fields are just amazing what you can do. All right, now we want to go look at a f the finished example and compare Power Pivot to formulas up front so we can kind of get an idea of how amazing the DAX formulas and Power Pivot 
really are. Now, here's our table, and this is over in a different workbook. We're going to have products and price, then sales rep and region, and over here we have some transactions. Uh, date, sales rep, product, a discount for each particular product the unit sold. Now, in this formula example, we went ahead and added some extra columns. I had to do VLOOKUP times 1 minus the discount rate to get the price. And then revenue was simply units times that uh, price. We had to do a VLOOKUP for that. Over in our Power Pivot solution, we are going to combine these two columns into a single calculated column. We will not use VLOOKUP. We'll have to use a function called RELATED, which does just what VLOOKUP does. Uh, this one we won't have to do in the table because we'll do it in our pivot table because we'll have relationships between the two tables. Now let's look at the final result. Here's what we're, we're after. We want average revenue per sales day. Now what makes that calculation complicated, especially by region, is if I look at the dates column, well, there's going to be lots of 6 to 2014s. So I need to get a unique count on this column. Oh, but wait a second. Once I get to region, then I have to make a unique count of dates given a, a, a criteria like east or midwest. So the formula solutions over here, here's the formula for unique count of just numbers, the dates. But here's the unique count formula for dates given a condition. So that's a pretty wild formula. So point number one, it's hard to create these formulas. It's going to be easier to do that over in Power Pivot. Although that could be debatable, what can't be debated is that these formulas are inflexible in that they are pointing to cells and criteria. I cannot easily, if at all, take this formula and change the criteria to say product. If I do that, I have to start all over. So given the complicated formulas and the fact that they're inflexible, let's go look at the solution in Power Pivot. Now, I wasn't supposed to have that there. I was supposed to show you this. This is um, the finished result in Power Pivot. It's with a pivot table. We have east. We have number of days. And there's our final result. That's the unique count formula. And when you see how we create it, it's a lot easier. There's a simple function called distinct count. All right, so it's a lot easier. But the main power is that once we create those DAX formulas and we can see them right here, those two are going to be our fields. They're called calculated fields because we, we made a formula that created this calculated field. We can drag and drop, and here's the power of them. The formulas do similar things that we, that we saw just a moment ago with the formulas. But now I can put them in a pivot table and simply drag and drop. And just like that, I get my a new criteria applied to that formula. That's the real power of this power pivot. All right, now we're going to go over and try and do this. All right, over in Excel, I want to look at the steps. Now, there's a bunch of notes here, but step one, convert your tables to Excel tables. Two, import Excel tables into power pivot. Three, define the relationship. Four, format the table if you want, add calculated columns, and finally, create your DAX measures. And then finally, build your pivot table. All right, let's go over to the sheet called Power Pivot. Here's our one, two, three tables. Now, this table, you always want to give them good names because these names are going to be used in formulas, right? So I'm going to come up here and call this Transaction Source Data. Enter. And then I've already named this one. This is Products Source data, and this one is sales rep source data. All right, so we've created tables. I did Control T. I just named them. Now we have to import them into Excel. Here's how we do it. We go over to Power Pivot and Add to Data Model. So I'm going to click Add to Data Model, and boom, it jumps it over to the Power Pivot window. We saw this earlier. There's our two tables we used earlier with the data model. There we have it. Now I'm going to Alt-Tab, click in the next table, click Add to Data Model. There it is. Alt-Tab, click in this, Add to Data Model. So we have our three tables. Notice that chain icon. That means they're linked. If this source data changes, 
the data will update. Now there are ribbon tabs up here. If you had different types of data, absolutely, just like over in Excel we have the Get External Data, you can import from all sorts of sources. Design, you can define your relationships, although there's an easy way I'll show you in just a second. Advanced and link tables. If you didn't want your data to update, you could come here and just like in Excel, there's automatic and manual for formulas, automatic and manual for uh, linked tables. Now, we want to do a few things here. First, let's format. I'm going to increase the column width. Come over here. You could add a number format. Right there, you can even do some, let's see, there's number format right there. I'm not going to add any number format. There's even some basic sorting and filtering. Come over to this table. Now, we are going to create a calculated column. Actually, before we get into any of the formulas, we have to build our relationships. And no problem, easier than the data model before, we simply click on da diagram view. There is our uh, table from earlier. Now I have one table here. The other tables are way over here. I can create my relic before, except for the. I'm going to go from sales rep to sales rep. That's the primary key in the sales rep table. And then product over to the transaction table. All right, so we have our two relationships. All right, I've clicked Save. I'm going to go back to Data View. I see there's a table right here. All right, so we've looked a little bit through this Power Pivot window. Now we need to add some uh, Calculate Columns. Now I'm going to show you a few. We're only going to use one of these in our formula. But just to show you how they relate to Excel, Calculated columns in these DAX formulas are very similar to Excel. There's 81 uh, calculated columns and I think 54 DAX formulas that are just for our uh, calculated fields. But here in this column, everything's pretty close to Excel. For example, if I want month, I would type equals. Notice I jump up to the formula bar and month tab. Can't use my arrow keys. I got to use my mouse. Now, month will give us number from 1 to 12. I control enter come up here and double click the field name and call it month. If you wanted to show text, I'm going to type an equal sign. And guess what? The TEX function from Excel isn't here. It's called format. It works the same way. I click on the cell, comma, and in double quotes, MMM for month, and double quote, close parentheses. Enter, and it adds it. Whoops, I have escape a period instead of a comma. Enter, and it adds the whole column. Call this text month. We could do a year too. I'm not going to use this in our table, but year. And that's just like our uh, Excel functions. Notice the square brackets. Those are field names. We've seen them in Excel when we use table formula nomenclature. You see them in Access. Uh, when we are dealing with fields, I'm going to hit Enter. Double click and call this year. Now the next calculated column is going to be our total revenue. And we're going to have to do a type of VLOOKUP. But there's not a VLOOKUP. Luckily, we did our relationships first, right? So the function isn't called VLOOKUP. It's called RELATED. And that's because there's a relationship. So RELATED, whoops, I did RAND, RELATED. And I'm going to go to the other table. That means I'm looking for price. So I'm going to go to the Products Source Data and click on the Price column. Close parentheses. That's a type of VLOOKUP, but over here in DAX formulas using a creating a calculated column. Enter. That'll give us just the price. So I'm going to come up here. Remember, we have to multiply it by 1 minus our discount rate each Transaction has a different discount rate. There's those square brackets, close parentheses. That will give us the adjusted price with the discount. Don't like all that decimals. Actually, we can use a round function. So this will be the third function we've seen that's similar, month, year, and round. I'm simply going to round this calculation. We're multiplying decimals there, and we run the risk of uh, extraneous pennies, which we don't want. So I'm going to round 
to the penny, which is 2. That's just like in Excel. Control Enter. There we have it. Now we can simply multiply this times units. And there's our formula right there, our uh, DAX calculated column. I'm going to come up here, double click, and call this revenue. All right, so we have imported the tables, did a little bit of formatting, defined our relationships, created our calculated columns. Now we have to go back over. We have our tables, and we want to create our DAX formulas. I'm going to Alt-Tab. Over here, we can go to Calculated Fields. Now we click the drop-down. There's New Calculated Field. There's Manage when you want to edit or delete any formulas. The keyboards work. And I should have done this for Add Data Model earlier. It's Alt-B to get to Power Pivot. There's Y for Add to Data Model. Calculated field is, oh, luckily it's F for formula and M for manage. So I'm going to escape, Alt B, F, and then Enter. All right, DAX formulas. We're going to have to create three formulas. And I'm going to create the distinct count formula first. We'll take a look at it, and then we'll come back and create the other two. Very important that the table you select up here is the table under which the calculated field name will appear. So I'm going to select Transaction Source Data. Our calculated field is Sales Days. Control-Shift-Home, Copy, Tab, Control-V, and I'm going to put Unique Count of Dates. Now I can create my uh, first DAX formula. Guess what? There's a new function called distinct count. No more of this crazy array formulas. It's simply use distinct count. Now, the table name is starts with T, so I come down to transactions. There's some functions. T means the whole table. M means there's a measure. And we want transaction, not DM, no, down here. Transaction Source Data Date. And I'm going to double click that, close parentheses, and click OK. That is going to be our, actually, I'm not going to click OK. That'll, that's our first formula there. But just like over in pivot tables, you create your number format actually in the dialog box for the field so that when you pivot, that number formatting follows. So I'm going to click Number because this is a count, zero decimals, and use a separator. Click OK. So there's going to be our first formula. If we needed to edit it, it's Manage. There it is. I'm going to click uh, Close. Now, let's go to Manage. And you can, the, the Manage window is already open. We can Alt-Tab back and forth. I have this table. All I want to do is create a pivot table and look at how that distinct count DAX formula calculates. So I'm going to click on Pivot Table. It says New Worksheet. I'm going to hit Enter. All right, so we have the same situation as earlier. We need to add our tables to the Active tab from the All. Transaction Source Data, whoops. Right click, Show an Active tab. Sales Rep Region, no, not DM. We want Sales Rep Source Data. Right click, Show an Active. So now I'm going to come over to Active, and there's our two tables. I'm going to drag Region down to Rows. And then I'm going to drag number of days down here. Now, I want you to take a look at this. Those numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now I want to go and look at our workbook with our formulas. There, we got the same exact numbers as we did with our DAX measure, but it was a lot easier. Now, why that number is not the total there. That number is actually the total unique count of dates. These have a, a criteria applied to them, and so they're showing the individual dates for each one of those. Remember, there could be some dates in the east that are unique that are also double counted in each one of these. So that's why the total doesn't uh, add up. All right, now I'm going to come down here and double click that sheet and name it something like Average Revenue by Sales Day. Enter. We still have two more formulas to create. So I'm going to come over here to Create Fields, Alt-B, F for Formula, Enter. Now, 
we have three calculations. And although we could calculate a total for all revenue in the pivot table, we actually need it inside of our formula to calculate a number and then use that as our denominator. So we're going to create a new a second formula, and it is going to come from transaction source data. We're going to call this total revenue. And this is going to be, say, total revenue for this. And this one, we're actually going to use an aggregate function. You've heard of this one before, sum. And we're going to sum just a field, but it's in the table transaction. So we're going to go down to transaction source data. And we're going to use a field. It is our calculated field. That's the revenue. So double click, close parentheses, and click OK. So now we have two formulas there. We are going to create a third formula based on both of these calculated fields. So I'm going to click New. This one is going to be Transaction Source Data. This is going to be Average uh, Revenue by Sales Day. All right, and so now we're going to create our formula. Hey, and watch this. We don't have to use the table names. We can just use our measure names are calculated field names. So I'm going to come down here, not sum of revenue, but total revenue. That is the field we created. And then divide by square bracket, and we have number of sales days. Now we click OK, and we have two more things we need to do. I forgot. For both of these total revenue, I need to edit. Luckily, we have edit. And I'm going to say currency for that one. Click OK. Revenue by sales days edit. Currency for that one also. All right, now I, have, I click Close. Wow, look at that. Those are already in the table. Now, I don't really need those right there. I'm going to just select, keep this one right here. Uncheck both of those, and there is that number. That number right there is not the total. That number right there is the average revenue for the total sales days. Now I'm going to turn that off. That's easy enough. I could go up to Design and go to Grand Totals and Off for Rows. And watch this. Here's our magic number. We have that formula there, and we can come up and do whatever we want, drag products down here. We could drag region up to the filter. Absolutely amazing. So our formula is totally pivotable. And that is quite amazing. So that's an example of Power Pivot and DAX formulas and calculated columns. Now we have one more topic we're going to talk about, Power View. Now I'm just going to do one quick silly example. Uh, we'll leave that for another video. But let's go over to Insert and Power View. Now Power View requires that you have tables and relationships entered in your data model. So I'm going to click on this, and we'll just insert a sheet. There's a sheet down here, Power View 8. And it is a place to create dashboards, reports that have titles, charts, and tables. Now it has a field list with our tables, a filter area, and a canvas. We can actually drop fields over here and begin to build a table or chart. Up here, there's the Power View ribbon tab. All right, so I'm going to come over here to our transactions table, open it, and drag products over here. Instantly, we'll see a small table. Everything starts with a table. I'm going to come up and drag average revenue by sales down below the fields. And there we have uh, a small table. Now, notice that uh, Power View was over here, but now we've started to do something over here, and it, it adds a new tab. Now, it's not like the other context-sensitive tabs, like pivot tables or charts. It just shows up as a regular tab. <laughs> All right, so then I'm going to change this to a clustered bar. And boom, just like that, we'll get a clustered bar. Over here, we have the Filter button and the Expand pop out. So I'm going to pop this out. Kind of nice the way it moves there. Now look down here at this axis. One nice thing about uh, Power View is it just does a lot of things for you. I'm going to change the field, uncheck 
average revenue, and check revenue. And look at this. Now, normally in a pivot table or a chart, you would have to add this special thousands format. This thousands format is not being sucked from the table. This Power View engine is assuming that that is an efficient format for this access. Now, there's tons of things you can do with this. I'm going to show you one last little silly thing, and then uh, that'll be it for this video. Let's instead of, um, oh, we have product here. I want to drag region down to vertical multiples. I'm going to go up. Again, we have a, a relationship, so we can do this. Open and click region and drag. Now, vertical multiples means we'll instantly get a bunch of charts all based on products. Is that totally amazing? Now, there's tons of other things we do here. That's just one little example. I'm going to double click and call this uh, Power View. That looks like present value. Wow, that was a lot for Excel 2013. We'll see you next video.